Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, we're going to get going in a quote unquote new topic. Um, you're probably used to this by now, right? What have we covered in extension two so far? We've looked at your very first topic was complex numbers. And even though in a real way it's like, ooh, this is new, square roots of negative numbers, we've kind of been anticipating it for years, like the first time you met a quadratic equation. And you'll, you know, you, we carefully gave you equations where everything turned out nicely, right? And then maybe one time you press some buttons by accident, you're like, uh-oh, math error when I was trying to put in my you know, quadratic equation. And we said, don't worry, don't worry about that. Maybe if you're worthy, we will explain this to you one day. And then complex numbers arrive, right? So that was a continuation, right? Um, 3D vectors was also a continuation of of 3D vectors with continuation of vectors. vectors, 2D vectors, right, which we did in extension one. Probably the only truly quote unquote um, new thing we've, we've done in extension two has been the nature of proof. But even half of the nature of proof was um, harder mathematical induction, which again, continuation of mathematical induction. We're going to drill down deeper into another area of the calculus courses you've been doing, Advanced Extension 1, and that's integration, which I know everyone's been in the thick of, right, in terms of what you've been doing in Extension 1. So we're going to try and, I'm going to try, and piece together everything for you. So if you haven't already, what I'd like you to draw, and you'll need the full width of your page to do this, because it's going to get busier than this in a second, you'll need three concentric circles um, that get smaller as you go in to the center of the page, as concentric circles tend to do. So what do we know within the advanced course when it comes to integration. Um, this is going to be a vast oversimplification, but I just want to give you some broad brushstrokes so we can connect the relevant concepts. Okay? Um, integration, or integral calculus, is kind of one half of calculus. What's the other half? Differentiation, Differentiation right? And that's kind of, ooh, oh, turn it on. Trained, trained professional, we've done that before. Um, differentiation is where we began. Right? And everything you learned about how to take a function and get its gradient out of it, that was what we covered as we introduced this idea. In fact, some of your textbooks and sometimes perhaps some of your lessons, we would have talked about uh, integration before we introduced that idea. We would talk about anti-differentiation, right? Not exactly the same, but pretty closely related. Um, and it was all about this idea of change, right? Calculus is all about change. Um, what does the derivative tell you in terms of change? Tells you gradient, right? But more than gradient, like gradient back in corner geometry days, gradient was you got one spot where you started and one spot where you ended. And gradient was the, it's the rate of change. It's the rise over run over this interval, right? What was special, what was more powerful about differentiation? Instantaneous gradient. Instantaneous gradient, very nice. It's not an average over like this amount of time or this amount of space. It was like at this particular point, right? So. Differentiation, how would we say it? It's an instantaneous rate of change. An instantaneous rate of change. That's so important, it's actually worth writing down, and I didn't get my wiper markers out. That instantaneous rate of change, how does it contrast to inst uh, integration? Instead of an instantaneous rate of change, I can fit it here. Instead of an instantaneous rate of change, what we've got in integration is, well, it's not instantaneous generally. What are we interested when, in when we talk about integration? Like we've got lower and upper bounds. So what's the opposite of instantaneous in this context? Hmm. Well, the whole idea of instantaneous is to get away from an interval and to get to like one single instant in time. I guess the opposite of this in the context of integration would be there's an accumulation. Right? It's like over time we accumulate, well, not a rate of change, but a accumulated total of changes which often looks like an area. Does that make sense? So we sort of compare this instantaneous rate of change to an accumulation of total change. Uh, I remember the first time I was introduced to the idea that area is the opposite of gradient, and geometrically that's weird. Why should the opposite of gradient be area? But when I saw this, I was like, oh, I get it now, right? Single point of time, interval of time, right? 
rate compared to what happens when you add up over this whole interval. So this is the place where we begin, right? And the lion's share of everything you know about integration, you know from differentiating first. And then we kind of spent a while <laughs> taking all those rules of differentiation that you know and then turning them into integration rules, right? So for example, if the uh, derivative of a polynomial term is going to be equal to, say it with me, n x to the n minus 1, right? We bring the coefficient, we multiply by the coefficient, and then we, sorry, multiply by the index, and then reduce the index by 1. How do you turn this differentiation rule into an integration rule? We're going to do these same two things, but reversed, right? And the order also matters. We did this second before, so now we'll do it first. We will increase the index, right? And then we will, instead of multiplying, we'll divide by the index, right? And um, much confusion, confusion ensued when we were like, which one are we doing? And we get them mixed up quite easily, right? But you got better at it. We've had a lot of practice, right? We did it with particular kinds of functions like polynomials. What else do you know how to differentiate and therefore integrate? What other kinds of families of functions do you have? You got trigonometric, what else? Logarithm, okay, we've got exponentials. I'm going to put like an asterisk on logarithms because we can differentiate logs and end up with a gradient function, but we can't integrate logs, can we? At least not in a straightforward way. We can integrate a thing that becomes a log, something that looks like this, right? What would you call this? This has a special name. So uh, I'm going to, well, I'm going to come to I'm going to come to that in a second, but like this object here, we've got some function divided by some other function. It's a, it's a ratio between two functions, right? So we would call this a rational function. Doesn't really matter so much what you call it, but knowing what this is about is important. So we can integrate something like this, it ends up being a log. So this is the whole idea, like we end up taking a lot of the differentiation rules and then turning them backwards, right? We spent a lot of time doing that. And then kind of the large major idea, and it's a very, very major idea, was we said, after doing this anti-differentiation idea, constant integration, all that kind of thing, primitive functions, right? We noticed that it was, well, trying to get at this accumulated idea, right? It's kind of different to when you've got a definite integral and you put numbers in, you substitute, right? And someone's already mentioned it. A definite integral gives us something quite different to a gradient function. It gives us an area, but more than an area. What kind of area does it give us? Does anyone know? So uh, it's often called an area under a curve, right? But I defy all of you to think about the fact that it's different to the area that you've learned for years and years. Yeah, maybe you, my, my function was a clue, right? If I gave you something like this, right? And I asked you what the area was, right? A year seven student could look at those um, triangles, get the dimensions, and off you go, right? But that's not what we would do. If we did the integral from, say, negative one to one of this function, right? We all know that we would not get what that year 7 student would get, what would we get in this case? We get zero because it's not just area, it's signed area. We're allowed to have negative areas depending on their position, which is slightly weird, but it's a different idea. So this is where we went, right? And we spent a long time on it, but that's not where we ended. Now, for me, one of the things that is kind of it's sort of where it begins, right? Um, you know how you told me you could do polynomials, you could do trig, etc. This is kind of how a lot of advanced integration felt to me when I was learning, and maybe it feels like to you. It's basically like, what does this thing look like? Is it, you know, going to be a trig function? It's going to turn into a trig function. It's going to be a polynomial. It's going to turn into another polynomial. And it's just a fairly straightforward. This is the thing. Fit it into there. Does that make sense? But as we've gone further, we want to get away from this metaphor. This is the way integration can feel in advance. But we wanted to give you more knowledge to expand your idea of what integration can do. So I told you to draw concentric circles, right? We're at the second layer out. What have we learned? And we've done it fairly recently, so maybe you can help me. What have we learned under extension one integration? There's really three key ideas, I'd say. Okay, so there's this idea of substitution. Now, I've drawn an arrow here to connect this, right? Because introducing a substitution to help you integrate something, right? When you see something such as, hmm. When you see something like this, right? Introducing a substitution like, in this case, what do you think would be helpful? You might be equal to, X cubed minus 1. I've deliberately written this question so it sort of stands out in front of you, right? 
Introducing a substitution here is really just the reversal of a rule that you saw before, and this goes to Calvin, did you mention it? No, who mentioned it? Um, yeah, a few of you. This is reversing the chain rule. Like this is what you would get if you differentiated something, you know, something like x cubed minus one to the power of eight. I don't know exactly what the coefficient would be, right? A lot of the rings today, hey? That's fine. That's okay, yes. Yeah, so obviously we're looking at a few different ideas here. Um, we're just reversing the chain rule. That's all substitution is, right? Does this make sense? So you can see there's this connection between what you learnt in advance, once you learnt in extension one. Give me something else. This is not the only thing you've learned in extension one integration. Oh, the trig ones. Okay, fantastic. You've got all of these trigonometric identities that as extension one students you have access to that in advanced we didn't learn, right? So those help you integrate a whole bunch of things that you couldn't have otherwise, like sine squared and cos squared come to mind, right? Then, lastly, right, as a major idea anyway, I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, uh, we've also learned about other kinds of functions within extension one, and so we learn how to differentiate and integrate those. Most specifically, we think about inverse functions. The most famous ones you know are the inverse trig functions, which we're going to look at shortly. Um, but these come out of the fact that, well, in extension one, we've got inverse functions. Let's learn how to differentiate and integrate them. Make sense? Okay. Now, this has made things harder, but I'm going to say this is kind of like, you know that box toy that I showed you before um, that kids sort things into? I'm just going to say this is kind of like a bigger box with more holes and more different things to fit into it, right? What we're going to do in extension two is blow the lid off of the box, okay? Um, like I said, no oversimplification, but this is going to be the path that we're going to chart through very roughly. Four ideas, I think. Number one. Uh, you've already passed, had this mentioned to you by some of your teachers. We're going to keep on this idea of integration by substitution, but unlike in extension one exams where we will always, always, always tell you what the substitution is, we'll say let u equal whatever, we won't specify in extension two. Uh, sometimes we will if we're feeling charitable, but other times it's like, you know what, just work it out. Um, sometimes it's not that hard to work it out. Other times, more challenging. We'll get to those shortly. Okay? So that's a big difference. Um, if you think back to this idea of reversing the rules, we get to learn this, it sounds very intimidating and scary, right? This new technique called integration by parts. Um, it's just a fancy way of re reversing a different rule that you learnt all the way back in advance. Does anyone know which one it is? It's kind of, it's kind of reversing the product rule. It's not about integrating a product per se, it's not quite as straightforward as that, but it's using the product rule in reverse. Uh, Four ideas, two down, two to go. Uh, we're going to look at these ideas called recurrence relationships, or some textbooks call them reduction formulas. Sometimes, if you want to think back to, say, uh, mathematical induction, right? Um, sometimes when you did a mathematical induction proof, you were doing the, you assumed for n equals k, and then you did, okay, let's prove true for n equals k plus 1. And then you started doing this big part of the work, and then you realize, oh, I need to prove something else in order to make this work, right? It's like this secondary proof. When it comes to integration, we have this equivalent problem where sometimes you integrate something, but integrating creates another integral that you have to solve, right? So it's integrals within integrals. It's sort of like a, a yo dog, I heard you like integrating, so I put a function in your function so you can integrate while you integrate. That kind of idea, right? That took me more times to practice than I'll admit. Now, <laughs> then, then, lastly, uh, we're going to have a look at a lot more algebraic manipulation that's going to make your eyes water a little bit, but once you get used to it, you'll be fine. Um, these things called partial fractions, which it's a bit tricky. Um, as teachers who've taught the course a bunch of times, Mrs. Lees and I, are used to connecting this to something back in the old course that you used to do. So um, we'll have to be careful with this one, but we're going to be dealing with polynomials that are identical to each other and then sort of attaching fractions to them and using that to help us integrate things that look impossible to integrate otherwise. You're like, I want it to look like this. I want it to look like this. And it doesn't. What else can we do with it? Answer, we can um, do a pr process called decomposition. Break it into fractions we can deal with. Okay. So this is the roadmap. This is where we're going to go. And as I said, we're trying to change the metaphor, right? So here's what I want to leave you with before we actually do some of this, right? I don't know if any of you know what this is or have seen enough of this by now. What is it, like 10 years or something in Australia? Um, someone want to tell me what this is? This is MasterChef, but specifically within MasterChef, this is called a... It's called a mystery box, right? And the idea is everyone walks in, all the contestants, and it's like, what's under the box? And there's some ingredients in there, right? 
Now the reason why I think this is a better metaphor, a more suitable metaphor to what we're going to do in extension to integration is, number one, when you open up and you see what ingredients are there, it's not just a matter of, oh, this is the ingredient, this is the thing you do with it. The whole point is to actually be creative and there are, for every single one of these questions you're going to meet, there will almost always be multiple paths through the integration. Some are easier than others and we will do our best to try and help you identify which is the easiest one, but there will just be lots of different ones, right? As opposed to, it's pretty much just one way to integrate this, right? We're trying to get away from that. We're trying to give you more interesting problems. Uh, secondly, secondly, if you were, if you were this contestant in MasterChef, right? You lift the lid and then lo and behold, a bunch of ingredients, right? Do you start, do you like immediately go and, work and like find a particular pan to use? Or get a particular knife out, right? Or do you start to turn on the oven? You can't do any of these things immediately, can you? Because what do you have to do first? Say one more time, Kevin. I just love that he gets it in one, right? You have to think. You have to think. It's not just a matter of, here's a thing and I'm just going to like blindly put it into particular spots until eventually I can ram it in, right? You have to think and consider really carefully. Here's one of the tricky things about this, right? Each of these methods you're going to use, they're often much longer than the integration you're used to, right? How many lines will this take? Maximum like three. Max three, right? Yeah. Unless you really want to stretch it out, but it's not much point. You could do it in less if you knew what you're doing, right? With these, we're going to see like page long integration questions, right? And what that will often mean is you need to think before you even begin. You've got to craft a path through this. So it's a bit more like the nature of proof questions that you do, or even the 3D vectors questions like stop, don't just start writing stuff, use this first. Right? That automaticity you've, you've gotten used to in advanced extension one, um, this ain't going to cut it in extension two. Make sense?